Well, if you haven't already turned there, please go ahead and turn to Luke 8, 22 through 25. And we have read over it a couple times, either what Adam just shared or what I shared in prayer. So I'm not going to reread these words. I just want to pray for us briefly that God would add his blessing to the reading and preaching and responding to his word. Would you join me? Lord, once again, we bow before you and ask that you would till, tenderize, fertilize, water the soil of our hearts so that we eagerly latch hold of the seed of the gospel, of the word of God, and that it grows deep roots and beautiful fruit for the sake of others for the sake of our own joy, for the sake of your glory and reputation. We pray this in Christ's precious name. Amen. All right, well, the title, as I mentioned earlier, is Jesus is in the boat with you. Uh, This story, Jesus calming the storm, is one of the most well-known, powerful, and encouraging accounts in all of the Word of God. Sinclair Ferguson, I've already quoted him once, but he reminds us that the truths that we see from Luke and Mark and Matthew as well invite us to draw one conclusion about Jesus. He is the Messiah. He is God's son. He is the king. He reigns over the forces of nature and chaos, over the power of darkness and sickness, disease, sorrow, and even death itself. Jesus is Lord of all. And I don't know if you've come to that conclusion in your life. Many of you have. By the grace of God, for the glory of God, I came to that conclusion when I was 17 years old. I know many of you have, and I pray that today would just strengthen that conviction. But if you are here today and you have not come to that conclusion that Jesus Christ is Lord of all, that he is worthy of worship, he is worthy of your life's allegiance, I pray that God's word and God's spirit would persuade you today. So as we've covered now almost eight full chapters in Luke, we have seen that Jesus is Lord over demons, disease, over distance, over death, over disaster, as we'll see this morning. Now, Bible Encyclopedia, let me read a couple of Quick facts for you about the Sea of Galilee. It's 33 miles north to south, 8 miles east to west. It's nearly 700 feet below sea level, and it's surrounded by mountains. That's important because because of the topography, it is notorious to this day of having sudden wind gusts come upon it without warning and very violent storms arise okay all of this to say that these seasoned fishermen that were in the boat with Jesus they knew this they knew this fact and yet this storm was so unexpected it was so violent that their faith in the Lord Jesus was truly put to the test but with every passage as with every passage in the scriptures the main idea is not the storm but the Lord of the storm. So we're going to talk about the storm for a little bit, but really we're talking about the Lord of the storm, Jesus Christ. Let me give you four precious pictures of Jesus briefly. Number one, Jesus is really human. He is truly human. He is fully human. We see this because in verse 22, Jesus was completely exhausted from serving his father. If you wonder what made him so tired, go back and read the first seven chapters of Luke. He was exhausted, so much so that after he gave the marching orders of let's get in the boat, let's go to the other side. That's very important, by the way. We'll get to that in a minute. But after that, he hit the cushion. Mark tells us about a cushion in the back of the boat. It's very descriptive. He hit the cushion and he was out cold. Now, this shows us that he was exhausted, but it also shows us that he was trusting fully in God, his Father. And he could 
Even though he knew what was about to hit him, he could sleep like a baby. This very vividly shows us his humanity. This is the only instance, by the way, in the Gospels of Jesus sleeping. We know he slept, of course. But this is the only instance of him sleeping. And what a time for him to sleep. What a time for him to sleep. So number one, Jesus is human. Number two, Jesus is God. I think we know that at this church, but this is, in, this is Luke's intention to remind us of this. Matthew tells us that this storm came without warning. He uses the word seismos to describe its power. We get the word earthquake from this. The boat was filling up. They felt like they were going to die, but Jesus, being awakened, stood and did two things. He literally told the wind, hold your peace, and he told the sea, be muzzled. I love what Donald Gray Barnhouse said. He said, get back in your doghouse. And the Bible tells us that immediately, almost eerily, the storm ceased, and it was a perfect calm. The scene went from like hurricane conditions to as calm as a sheet of glass and as quiet as a church mouse in the blink of an eye. This was truly amazing. This is meant to show us not only Jesus' humanity in that he was sleeping, but his deity in that he was Lord of creation. Now, I could give you several. I looked up several of these, but for time's sake, I just want to give you a handful, uh, maybe three. This should remind us of Old Testament passages where God, Yahweh, is in charge of the weather. Job 12, 15, Behold, he, Yahweh, restrains the waters, and they dry up, and he sends them out, and they inundate the earth. Job 37, 6, For to the snow, he says, fall on the earth, and to the downpour and the rain, be strong. Job 37, 9 through 13. Out of the south comes the storm, and out of the north the cold. From the breath of God ice is made, and the expanse of the waters is frozen. Also with moisture he loads the thick cloud. He, dis he disperses the cloud of his lightning. It changes direction, turning around by his guidance, that it may accomplish what he commands it on the face of the earth, whether for correction or for his world or for loving kindness. He, Yahweh, causes this to happen. Jot down Psalm 107, verse 24 through 31. That's a lengthy passage, but it's, it's basically the same thing that we read in uh, Luke 8 here, where God calms the storm. Yahweh calms the storm, and there's a perfect peace. The point is, and the, the disciples were learning about their, their Old Testament, uh, committed Jews knew about their Old Testament, but this is showing us that God is in charge of the wind and the waves. The wind and the waves are in complete submission to God. What about the Red Sea? I didn't even mention that, but we could have included that. Jesus is showing us that he is in charge of the wind and the, the sea. Conclusion, Jesus is God. Jesus spoke words to the wind and the sea, and these, these um, entities recognized the voice of their creator. And like obedient servants, they obeyed immediately, and the wind and the sea were quiet and still at once. So Jesus is human. He is God. Number three, Jesus is fully in charge. Now, bear with me on this. This is something that I think we miss in this story. What I mean by Jesus is fully in charge, and you may say, well, you've just shown us that Jesus is God, so of course he's fully in charge. But did you make this connection? Jesus led them into the storm. You might think, how is this a precious picture of Christ? I thought you were giving us four precious pictures of Christ. How is it precious that he led them into the storm? None of us enjoys having our worlds turned upside down. I think we would all agree with that. 
But I also have been a Christian long enough, and I've been a pastor long enough, and I've been a human being long enough that when I talk to people and when I'm honest with myself, I've never heard someone say, the times that I grew in my faith the most were when everything was going hunky-dory, when everything was easy, speezy, lemon squeezy, macaroni and cheesy. <laughs> the times that we grow the most, the times that we say, oh, the Lord was near to me, the Lord grew my faith, the Lord uh, strengthened my insights of who he is and who I am, those are during the trials. These are some of the sweetest times in our lives, if we're honest. Now, they may not be at that moment, but when we get a little bit into them, we can say, wow, God's doing something sweet here. And this is, this is intentional. This is intentional. Um, Psalm 119, verse 71 says, It was good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. Psalm 119, verse 75, I know, O Lord, that your judgments are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. In faithfulness you have afflicted me. So he is fully in charge and he is leading them into this storm. They had no clue of what was about to hit them. He absolutely knew what was about to hit them. In fact, he led them into it. A fourth picture we see is Jesus is full of patience. There's a lot of rebuking going on in verses 24 and 25. Okay, Jesus is rebuking the wind and the waves. Uh, the disciples are rebuking Jesus. But he's rebuking the disciples, but he's doing it so patiently. Look with me again in verses 24 and 25. They came to Jesus and woke him. The storm didn't even wake him. It's, it's almost a miracle that the storm didn't wake him. It, it, this was a violent storm. They, they woke him. Master, master, we are perishing. As I mentioned, Mark includes the phrase, don't you even care? And he got up and rebuked the wind and the surging waves, and they stopped, and it became calm. And he said to them, where is your faith? That's the rebuke. That's his rebuke to them. But it, it's not a harsh, merciless rebuke. It's reasonable. It's loving. It's patient. And notice this, and we, we could learn from this, church. Jesus first took care of them, and then he taught them. Right? He, he, it wasn't that he... Right in the middle of the hurricane, so to speak, he, he stands up and, and teaches them a lesson and shakes his finger in their face, right? What they needed first is, could you help us? We, we're, we're goners. And he calmed the wind and the waves, and then he spoke to them lovingly but firmly. This story is teaching us that Jesus is the main character, not the storm not the disciples. It's showing us some things about Jesus, and that's what trials do. Yes, they show us things about us. Most of the time when the Lord leads me into a trial, I come away with this realization. My faith wasn't as strong as I thought it was, but I don't feel condemned by the Lord for that. I feel like, thank you for showing me that, because that, that gives me an eagerness a desire to seek you more and to have my faith strengthened. So thank you for pointing that out to me, Lord. But it shows me more of who he is, his faithfulness, his desire to knock off the rough edges in my life and make me more like him. It shows me that he understands that he is sovereign, that he leads us even into the storm. And it shows me that he is in the boat with me. Please don't lose that. If you, if you forget everything I say, walk away with that. That Jesus Christ is in the boat with you. That made all the difference for David. Think about Psalm 23 with me. You know that psalm very well. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. 
David said, as long as you're with me, I can walk through anything. And that's what we learn when we go through the storms. Well, that's four precious pictures of Christ. Here's two painful pictures regarding Christians, regarding you, regarding me at times. Number one, they, the disciples, forgot his love. They forgot who he really was. Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him, right? They forgot really who he was, and they forgot his love. They developed spiritual amnesia in the storm, and that's very common. Very common. Spiritual amnesia during the storm. I read to you Sinclair Ferguson during our prayer time, but it, it's, worth, it's worth reading again. Precious words. This was the cruelest question that they could have asked him. Do you care? Do you not care, rather? This is the very reason he was in the boat with them. Indeed, the very reason he was in the world and the reason he was going to die on the cross for them. This was the reason precisely because he cared for them. I want to encourage you, church. When you're in the storm and someone said, we're either in a storm or we've just come out of a storm or we're heading into a storm. Okay? And when you're in it, don't have spiritual amnesia. If you doubt God's love for you, don't look at your circumstances. Look at the cross. Okay? When you are in the storm, don't look around at the storm. Don't look at your circumstances. Look at the cross. This is God's demonstration of his love for you. It is outside of you. It is outside of, of your time and space. It is a real historical event. God sent his son to live for you, to die for you, to be buried for you, to be raised for you. This is God's stamp of love for you. And it doesn't change like the weather. Romans 5, 8, we know this verse. But God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John 4, 9 and 10, By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the payment for our sins. So, number one, they forgot his love. You forget his love sometimes. I forget his love. I have spiritual amnesia from time to time. Number two, they forgot his word. They forgot his word. Look back at verse 22. I said this was important and we come back to it. He says, let us go over to the other side of the lake. They had seen Jesus raise the dead. They had seen him lord over distance, lord over disease, lord over demons. And he said, let us go to the other side of the lake. In other words, they were going to get to the other side because Jesus Christ said, we're going to the other side. They forgot that. We're going down. We're going to die. Don't you even care? Wake up. No, they weren't going to die. No, they weren't going to drown. They were going to get to the other side. Why? Because Jesus, Lord of all, said, get in the boat. We're going to the other side. And they forgot that. Sometimes we say, Hey, I'll see you soon. Lord willing, and the creek don't rise, right? The Lord's willing. It doesn't matter if the creek rises. We need to remember that. We forget Christ's love. We forget Christ's word. They felt like he had abandoned them. He had not abandoned them. He was literally in the boat with them. Two, we'll close with this, two powerful pictures regarding Christianity. Number one, Christians have always had this rhythm to their life. To some degree, more. To, in, in some instances, more. In some instances, less. But persecuted, yet prevailing. Persecuted, yet prevailing. William Lane, in his commentary, says that the early church during this time was in deep persecution. Jesus wanted them to know that this had not caught him off guard. He had led them into the persecution. 
Think about that. This, this picture of Jesus in the boat became a rallying cry for the early church. If you go back and look at early church, early Christian art, this picture of the storm and the boat and Jesus stilling the storm, this, this was very popular. And not just because it's a cool story, but they understood the connections that you're the Lord of all. And you lead us into the storm sometime, but you are with us in the boat. And this became a rallying cry for the early church. Persecuted, yet prevailing. Now listen very carefully. Here's where we could go way wrong. Because if I just wrapped it up and said, God bless you, have a great week. Then you might get the impression that's so common and popular today that, oh, well, if I trust Jesus... That means I'm in the boat, but he's in the boat, and the, the boat's never going to sink. And we're always going to get to the shore safely. They got to the shore safely. But this doesn't mean that every trial that Jesus leads us into will end with us safely on the shore of Galilee. It may be that the storm that Jesus leads you into, leads me into, will lead us safely to the shores of heaven. Okay, we've read about John the Baptist already in this account, and John, his boat sunk. Okay, John was beheaded with questions in his heart. Is this really the Christ that we've been looking for? Or is this some imposter? And we, we hope that he had all of those doubts resolved. I'm not doubting his salvation. I'm just saying, you know, sometimes we don't get the answers that we're looking for in this life. We get them in that one. But he was beheaded. So the ship sank for John. The ship does sink for many Christians. Hey, let's take Judas Iscariot out of the picture all but John the Revelator died a martyr's death. So please don't think that I'm preaching or that Jesus is teaching this health and wealth and prosperity gospel that if you put your faith in Jesus, you're never going to have another problem. You're always going to get safely to the shore. And if you don't, it's really your fault and you need to, need to shape up. Let me read a few from stories that you've probably heard looking back over church history. John Huss was burned for his faith at the stake. And history tells us that he sang praises to Jesus until his face caught on fire. Nicholas Ridley Hugh Latimer were burned at the stake together. And as the fires were lit, Latimer cried out, Be of good comfort, Master Ridley. Play the man. Play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out. Hudson Taylor lost his wife, Maria, as they both sought to take the gospel to China. But as he stood over her grave, he sang these words, Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. I am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart. We don't have to look back that far to know that sometimes the ship sinks. There have been times in your life where you have put your trust in Jesus and it didn't happen the way you thought it would happen. And I hope that you grew and are growing through those times. I hope that you didn't throw in the towel and say, I quit. This is not what I signed up for. You, you probably didn't or you wouldn't be here this morning. Jesus has promised us this. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. But he has never promised us 
that following him would exempt us from suffering or from trials. And you might even add this, he loves you way too much for that. He loves you way too much for that. Trials are a way of growing your faith. Again, I said one of the things that God does in my life through trials is he shows me that my faith is not quite as strong as I thought it was. But another thing that he does is he reminds me of how faithful Jesus is. Listen to what Ferguson said. He said, every test and trial, every storm in life is another opportunity for you to see the glory of Jesus Christ and discover his power in your life. It's a chance for you to see Jesus for who he really is. So that's the first powerful picture of Christianity. It's persecuted, but prevailing. You're going to prevail either to the shore of Galilee or to the shore of heaven. You're going to prevail because of Christ and his faithfulness. Here's the last one I'll leave you with. Christianity is a, is a strange mingling of fear and love for Jesus Christ. Fear and love. Did you notice that when Jesus stood up, told the wind, peace, told the waves, get back in your doghouse, and immediately a hush fell over the, the place. Did you notice that the disciples were more afraid of God in the boat with them than of the storm outside of the boat. They were, they were terrified. And, and you would be too. I mean, this is something you don't see every day. And, and they said, who is this? That even the wind and the waves obey him. So there's this fear. They did not high-five Jesus and say, cool, do it again. Christ is unique, one of a kind, in a class all by himself, truly human. We've talked about that. Truly God. We've talked about that. Truly in charge. Truly patient. Christians love the God they fear and fear the God they love. It's an interesting dynamic. We cannot fit Christ in our back pocket safely. If you've looked at or read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the quote, C.S. Lewis, Aslan, the Christ figure, is good, but he is not safe. Christ will lead you into storms only to save you and deliver you through the storm. Might not make sense to you. He will lead you into the storms to show you more about you. He will lead you into the storms to show you more about himself and his glory. And when you see him for who he is, you will not have some glib, shallow, high five, give it to me, Jesus. You rock kind of attitude. You will have fear and reverence in your heart. But you will also have love in your heart. Again, Christianity is this strange mingling of you love the God you fear and you fear the God you love. This is evidence of the new birth. Let me give you a few quotes to close this with. A.W. Tozer said, The most important thing about you is what comes to your mind when you think of God. The God of this 20th century, Tozer says, no more resembles the supreme sovereign of Holy Scripture than does the dim flickering of a candle resemble the glory of the midday sun. The God who is now talked about in the average pulpit, spoken of in the ordinary Sunday school class, mentioned in much of religious literature of the day and preached in most of the so-called Bible conferences is the figment of human imagination and an invention of maudlin sentimentality. A God whose will is resisted, whose designs are frustrated, whose purpose is checkmated, possesses no title of deity, and so far from being fit as an object of worship, merits nothing but contempt. 
Albert Einstein, who we don't believe was a Christian, I hope we're wrong, hope we see him in heaven, said, I haven't seen anyone in awe of God the way the creator of this deserves. Shame on Christians. He was throwing a, a rock at Christianity, saying, you say that you love and know the God who made all the stars in the sky? I haven't seen such respect for the God who made this. J.B. Phillips, in his little book, Your God is Too Small, said, God may thunder his commands from Mount Sinai, and men may fear, yet remain at heart exactly as they were before. But let a man once see his maker down in the arena as a man, suffering, tempted, sweating, and agonizing, finally dying a criminal's death, and he is a hard man indeed who can see this and remain untouched. He goes on to say, may the accounts that we see in Scripture, and I would say to you this morning, may the account that we've seen in Luke 8, 22 through 25, Jesus calming the storm. May these cause you to put down any view of Jesus that is less than this. Fully God, fully man, fully in charge. And I had full of patience. This Jesus and this Jesus alone is worthy of your love and your life. This Jesus and this Jesus alone is worthy of your reverence. Worthy of your all in all. Let me pray for us, but, but listen. What are you going through right now that in God's providence, this passage on this Sunday... This congregation, what storm are you in right now? What storm might you be in this time next week? What storm have you just come out of that you needed this truth? Jesus is in the boat with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. I started out this morning. I said, I don't know if you have been persuaded to trust and entrust your life to Jesus as Lord of all. I hope that by God's grace, for his glory, I hope that by God's word and by his spirit, you have been persuaded. Put your trust in Jesus. He alone is worthy. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you, thank you for your patience, for your love, for your sovereignty. Thank you for this glimpse of your glory that we've seen in Luke 8, 22 through 25. Jesus, I pray that you would calm the storms that we're going through right now. But Lord, I pray that you would do that in such a way that we stand in awe of you, that our faith in you is increased, that we would love you so much that even if the ship sinks, we know that you're going down with us. Pray this in your name. Amen.